Hello fellow Scratchers! What better way to enhance our classic platformers than to introduce enemies into the fray? You may recognise this little red chomping fellow from my Apple game. The great thing about enemies is that unlike spikes or lava, enemies tend to be a lot more dynamic, bringing the level to life and also requiring more skill to avoid or to take out. So we'll be adding simple enemy spawning, movement, gravity, incline traversal and finally the ability to squish an enemy by jumping on its head. Classic stuff indeed. So what are we waiting for? Let's get scratching. We begin where we left off in episode 10, saving our project as a new copy. For this is episode 11. So I'm thinking to place the first enemy down here on the very first scene. It'll be best to make a new sprite for the enemy, and I'll name it Enemy. <laughs> Makes sense. For fun, I'm drawing the little red enemy dude from Apple. Begin by drawing a simple square. Now we can check the size looks good on the stage view, and we can also drag them into a suitable space while we're at it. When you design an enemy, remember to always draw them facing to the right. Even if you want them to face left or rotate to fly upwards, it really doesn't matter, we still draw them facing right. Always. Then, once you have them drawn, just double check that the costume is centred on the canvas. I do that by selecting the whole thing and then dragging them to the middle where they should just snap into place. There. You see, if your costume is not centred in the costume editor, then its position and collision sensing gets way messed up, and in turn that causes bugs later on, so you really want to get this centering step mastered. Right, let's give this enemy costume a name. Red 1. I use a 1 because next up we are going to add more costumes for simple enemy animation. I want them to open and close their mouth. So duplicate Red 1 costume, and now we have a Red 2. Select the entire top half of the costume, rotate it and move it back into place. Nice. We then do the same again, duplicating red 2, and we widen the mouth further still. Brilliant. To complete the animation we need the mouth to begin to close once more. Simplest way to achieve this is to cheat and duplicate costume 2 again, dragging them to the bottom of the list. Now we have the costumes in animating order, from closed to open, and then beginning to close once more ready to loop back around to fully closed, and then to repeat. Excellent. We just need one more costume, and that is for when Red gets squashed. Duplicate costume 1, and drag it down to the bottom of the list. I think we should name it Red Squish. <laughs> then just flatten the costume by selecting it all and dragging from the top downwards. This ensures the bottom won't lift off the ground. You might also like to pull out the sides a bit to give that extra squished look. If you hold down the ALT key while dragging, then it sizes around its middle, which is extra useful here. Super! Right, costumes are done. It's time to do some coding. We've used a number of methods to bring sprites into the game. The collectibles were clones that we spawned across the entire level right at the beginning. The lifts and danger sprites, well they weren't clones, but instead have one sprite that we reused on each scene where needed. But for enemies, we will do something a little different again. Using clones that would allow us to have more than one enemy per scene, I like that, but to avoid building up loads of clones and any overheads that that might bring, we'll only spawn them when needed, and despawn them again when we leave a scene. So, as normal when working with clones, the original sprite should be hidden. When flag clicked, hide. Let's work on enemy spawning. They will appear when we enter a scene. So, when I receive change scene, then check which scene we entered. If scene equals 1. Ok, so the player has entered scene 1. We want to clone a new red enemy. Drag in a go to xy block. Ok, hold on, I actually want to move them further to the right over here. Now remove that block and drag in a new one. That way it's all set with the x and y values for the new position. Next up we want to face left, with a point in direction negative 90. 
Cool. That's the basics. So we can go ahead and create a clone of myself. That will ensure that the new clone is created, positioned, and orientated just as we want. But just like the original sprite, it too will start hidden. Easy to fix. Bring in a when I start as clone hat block and show. Nice and simple. Let's give it a test. Just click play. Oh man, what? <laughs> Red, what are you doing upside down, man? Obviously, the rotation mode of this sprite is not set correctly. We'll address this under the when green flag clicked hat. Pop in a set rotation mode to left right. That should stop the sprite appearing upside down and limit it to only flipping left and right. Okay, much better. The enemy spawning is working, but if we move on to the next scene, ah, the enemy is still here. We need to ensure we despawn them again as we leave a scene. Now, we have a number of options of how to do this. We already have the when scene changed event that triggers when we move off a scene and enter a new one. But to make things really clear, and easy to follow, I suggest we add a new event that runs before this one for leaving a scene. For this, we should click into the player sprite. And we need to find the define begin scene scripts. This is where we are broadcasting the change scene event. We now want another broadcast before this one. So separate off the stop block, duplicate the broadcast and join it all back together. Next, we'll change the first broadcast to send out a new message. Now in retrospect, I think a better name for this might have been leave or exit scene, but I gave it the name about to change scene. Of course, it really doesn't matter, but do feel free to name it whatever you like. Okay, so back to the enemy sprite. We can now bring in a when I receive about to change scene. And to remove all the enemy clones is now easy. Just delete this clone. Cool. Now the begin scene event can safely run and everything should be good. Shall we test? Yeah, the enemy clones are gone. Whoop whoop. So what next? Well, this enemy is looking a bit floaty. Shall we add in some gravity to bring them down to the ground? Make sure we are still in the enemy sprite and we'll continue coding in the when start as clone script. They need their own little game loop, so bring in a forever block. For gravity, we need a speed y variable. Make it for this sprite only, as each clone needs its own speed. Initialize speed y to zero just before the forever loop begins. Gravity is simply a constant force pulling downwards, so we change our speed y by a pull of negative one each game tick. Then actually move the enemy with a change y by and drop in the speed y variable. Yeah, you'll see this a bazillion times in all our games. But this is not enough, as of right now the falling enemy falls straight through the level. We need to stop them but as lifting them out of the floor requires a bit of extra looping, we'll need that custom block magic. Make a new custom block, naming it move down. And yes, tick the run without screen refresh block. We need it. Okay, we will move the gravity code into this new custom block and replace it with a move down. Great. So now, if after moving the enemy down here, we find we are overlapping, that is touching the level, we want to move the enemy back up again until they are not touching the level. Simplest way to do this is with a repeat until block, and we repeat until we are not touching the level. Okay, so after we've moved down, if they are not touching the level, then this repeat doesn't even run. But if they are, then we repeatedly change y by 1 to bring them up until they are again no longer touching the level. Sweet, we just need to reset the fall speed by setting their speed y to 0. And that's it! Testing the project now shows the enemy is nicely grounded. 
If I go back to the project view, then I can drag them around and they always fall back to the ground. Excellent. We are ready to move on. In fact, moving on is exactly what we want this enemy to do. So a new custom block for this to match the move down one. Name it move left and right. Tick to run without screen refresh. And it would be best to make use of this before the move down block, I think. So assuming the enemy is facing left or right, let's use the move block and move two steps forward. Then we check for collisions. We may have hit a wall, right? So if touching level, then we move back out of the wall with a move minus two steps, negative two steps. And then we just turn them around to walk back the opposite direction. Turn clockwise by 180 degrees. It's testing time. Here we go. The enemy is coming this way. They hit the wall, turn around and walk off. And oh, they appear to be sulking at the edge of the level, like one of my pet toads. They also bury their heads in the ground and pretend not to be there. Yep, yeah, we can see you, Red. Well, we can choose here to do one of two things. Either they walk off the screen or they turn around and come back. I say we turn them around. So instead of just checking touching level, we need an OR block and also check for touching edge. That is the edge of the screen. Now when we test the game, the enemy also turns when they reach the edge of the screen too. Perfect. This is looking really good. But you know, often when you draw levels in scratch, surfaces are not perfectly straight. And if I was to introduce a small bump into the level, I think we will find that the enemy can be thwarted all too easily. What we need to do is let them have a little bit of lift to get them over these small obstacles, but still turn them around when hitting a wall. We can start by separating off the if touching script. Now instead we will give the enemy a number of tries to get out of the floor before giving up and turning around. A good block for this is a repeat block and I'm plumbing for a repeat four times. But hold on, we haven't even asked if we actually have collided yet. Well no problem, we do this first thing inside this repeat loop. If not, then bring back the touching checks into here. If we have moved sideways and are not touching the level or the edge of the screen, then we don't want to do anything. So just stop this script. See, it doesn't matter that we have entered this repeat block. We will still stop running this move and left block here and all is done. But if we are touching the level, then we can try moving Y by one to get out of a slope. And this will now give us four tries. If at any point it manages to get out of the level, then the script stops and it's all okay. No need to turn around, it was just a slope. But if the enemy is still touching the level after four tries of moving up, then we give up. This is too much for the enemy to get around. We need to ensure we return them back down the four pixels. So change Y by negative four. And then we bring back the move minus two steps and turn 180 degrees. That will turn the enemy around as before. Excellent. That makes sense, doesn't it? Let's test. Oh yes, very cool and smooth. They are gliding nicely back and forth and that little bump in the road doesn't pose us with any problems. Great, so with the movement done, we can focus next on animations. Now, if we were to just begin switching enemy costumes, we would instantly begin hitting the same old problem of sprite collisions occurring due to changes in costume size and shape. Now, this is because we are not at present using hitboxes for the enemies. So the collisions are done using the enemy's current costume. We need to ensure that the collision detection, the touching blocks, always use the same costume. So let's begin by ensuring that this is the case. At the start of the forever loop, before we move the enemy, switch the costume to red one. Now, because our enemy is square, we might as well just use this as our hitbox but you could, if you like, draw a new costume for this. Now, we should also set the rotation mode to don't rotate, because if you remember, even flipping the direction of the costume can cause the same hitbox changing issues. 
we don't want to leave them always facing right. So after the player is moved each frame, we reset the costume and rotation mode to how they were before. Red 1 and left and right mode. Good, looking sensible. So now for the animations. Since we are always switching costume back to red 1 for the collision detection, we'll need to keep track of the current animation frame in some other way. Make a new variable named frame for this sprite only. We'll initialize frame to 0 before our forever loop kicks off. And then we'll need to change frame by to animate through the costumes. Put it just before we switch the costume back to red 1 here. But rather than adding 1, let's slow down the animation to once every 3 or so frames by changing frame by 1 third, that's 0 0.33 around. You will probably have seen this math script before. In the switch costume we need an addition operator. Now we are beginning the animation on costume 1 here, and we animate over the four costumes before looping back to costume 1 again. So we start on costume 1, stick that in on the left. Then on the right we need a floor block. This rounds numbers down to their nearest whole number. So from frame 1.33, down to frame 1. Next we need mod to loop us around each of the four costumes. So the 4 goes in on the right. Mod gives us the remainder after division. Now we can place the floor of the frame on the left of the mod. Ta-da! That's it! Start on frame 1 and loop around the next four frames over and over again. And that's it! And there we have it! The animation is looking great! And the animation speed is working well too. So are you ready to get a little more interaction going off here? It shouldn't be hard to allow this enemy to hurt us, since the danger sprite does this already, with just a broadcast of lose life. Indeed, at the end of the forever loop, drop in an if block. And look for when the enemy is touching player. I don't want to extend this loop with too many scripts, so make a new custom block, naming it touching player. But this time, don't tick the run without screen refresh. We may want to add some animation into this script after all. Yeah, so make use of the block right away when we know we are touching the player here. And for starters, just drag in a broadcast, lose life. We are going down. So run the project. Here we go. Touching the enemy. Wah! What was that sound? The player death sound got looped over and over in the most horrible way there. So we must be triggering the lose life over multiple frames. The problem is that the enemy keeps moving after we die, which I like, and then they are still checking for collisions as we are fading out. We need to prevent further checks while the lose life animation is playing. Okay then, so no problem. Uh, when we check for touching player, Add in an AND block and an equals. We'll need a new variable, name it INVULNERABLE for all sprites. This will indicate that we cannot be killed. And we'll check whether it equals 0. So if the player is not invulnerable and the enemy is touching the player, only then do we trigger the loser life. That's all very well and good, but we need to now set the invulnerability when we lose a life. That will be in the player sprite, so click in there and find the when I receive lose life script. Then right at the top, stuff in a set invulnerable to 1. Nice. That should prevent the horrible sound, but we also need to reset this back to 0 when the game begins. So find the define reset and begin level script and we'll set invulnerable to zero right at the top. Excellent, let's test that out. Oh phew, that is a relief. That is much more bearable. Good work. Of course, everyone knows though that we should be able to jump on this enemy's head to defeat it. That would be a great addition to this project, and we'll detect it by looking for when the player is simply moving down from above. Place an if 
before the broadcast lose life. If the speed y of the player is less than, uh, we need to get the speed y from the of block from the sensing category. And I'm going to plumb for a speed of minus one. We want to be sure they are traveling downwards when they touch the enemy. Now, we should play a squish sound from the sounds tab. We can search up one. Here we go. Squish pop should be good. So in the if, start sound, squish pop. Now remember we made a costume for when the enemy was squished. Switch costume to red squish. Next, we want to wait for a moment, perhaps 0.3 seconds, before fading away. To do that, we repeat 10. That is why we didn't tick the run without screen refresh, otherwise this would not have animated. And we change ghost effect by 10, as 10 tens are 100, and it will have totally faded away. Super! We just need to finally delete this clone after the repeat loop has finished off. Shall we give this a quick test? I should be able to jump on his head. Oh man, I just ran into him. Let's try that again. Yeah, there we go. Squished him flat. But there's something missing here. Did you see what it was? Yeah, we need the player to bounce up again. It just looks wrong with the player landing on the ground after the squish. Since we can't set the player's speed Y from the enemy sprite, we need to broadcast. Right, before playing the squish sound, and broadcast a new message named Player Bounce. Click into the player's sprite and find some space. When I receive Player Bounce, We just set speed y to, um, how about 10? We can always change this at a later date, if it seems too much or too little. You know what to do by now. Shall we test that out? Splendid! I really like that. The little bounce just makes all the difference. Okay guys, I wonder if you have been concerned about where I placed this first enemy. Did any of you think, oh man, he's going to regret that when the player tries to come back onto the first scene? Well, if so, then you would be quite right. See how unfortunate this is? In years gone by, I have played actual commercial games where this has been a problem. We need to be more careful to consider all the directions a player might enter a scene, such that they don't stumble onto an enemy spawn zone and get an auto kill. However, we can be a bit more cunning yet. But to do so, we should first improve our enemy spawning script. Click into the enemy sprite and find the when I receive change scene script. We'll make a custom block to wrap up all the positioning and cloning here. Name it spawn. Add an input of type, then a text label of at. Then two numeric inputs of x and y. A text label of dir, dir for direction, and an input of dir too. Great, run without screen refresh. We can move the position and the clone script in there and make use of the block in its place. Now the type part is not currently used, but I find it nice to give it a name, so stick in red. Then we copy the X and Y positions, and of course the direction of minus 90. Coolio, we just need to link up the X and Y inputs to the go to XY, and the dir input to the point in direction. And that is that. Give it a quick test. Yeah, looking good. So what was I saying about a cunning plan? Right, yes. So the cunning plan is, why do we have to position the enemy in the same place all the time? Why not change their position if the player comes into the scene from a different direction? Can we do that? Sure we can. Stick in an if else around the spawn block right in here. We need to check which side of the screen the player is on. Stick in a less than comparator. And we are looking for the player's x position. If x position of player is less than zero, then we have entered the scene from the left. 
so we are fine to position the enemy to the far right. Now, let's duplicate the spawn block into the else. So where should we spawn the enemy if the player entered from the right of the scene? Well, make the enemy visible on the stage, and position them further over to the left, away from the auto kill zone. For me, that gives an X of 87, so I enter that into the new X spawn position. Also, I want the enemy to be facing right, so change the direction to 90. Finally, we can test that. The game starts with our enemy on the far right as before, so leaping over him, we can come in from the right. Yes, we didn't die, which is a great sign. And yes, the enemy now appeared over to the left as we came into the scene. Brilliant. So of course, you only need to do this if you want the enemy to behave differently when you enter the scene from left or right. Otherwise, we can just leave a single spawn block for a scene. But what if you wanted to make more than one enemy per scene? Can we do that? Well, yes, of course. Just stop the project, remake the enemy sprite visible, and position it where you want them to spawn. Then, duplicate a new spawn block within the same if scene equals one, and fill out the X and Y position from the current X and Y position on the stage. And I'll make them face left. Okay, give that a run through. So you see, both enemies have spawned at the same time, and everything is working great. In this game, the enemies always respawn once you return to a scene. You may or may not want this. If there's a great demand, then I'll show you other ways that this can work in later tutorials. But this keeps the game more lively. Okay, we are close to concluding this episode now, but one last thing I want to cover is how we might prevent this top enemy from falling off of the top platform. Often we want to keep enemies patrolling within certain zones. The simplest way to achieve this is by adding safe zones, that is areas where enemies cannot walk, like extra walls that only appear to enemies. Start by duplicating the danger sprite. I chose this because it has the least scripts, so it will need the least cleaning up. Name it safe zones. Then in the costume editor, delete all but the blank costume. Now as I want to add safe zones to scene one of the game, I will click into the level sprite and copy scene one costume into the new safe zone sprite. Cool, click back into the safe zone sprite now. We can now draw in any enemy blocking walls. I want one right here at the edge of this top platform. So running the project now, you can see the new wall has appeared, but it's not doing anything. So click into the enemy sprite and find the move left right script. As well as colliding with the level, we now want to also collide with safe zones. But you know, this script is getting a bit too wide for my liking, so pop in a second if inside the first. Because these are not touching, we can say not touching safe zone here and it works just the same. Run that now. And you should find the player can jump right through these zones. But the enemy? They cannot. That's perfect. The only drawback is that we don't really want these to be visible to the player like this. The best quick fix is, within the safe zone sprite, set ghost effect to 100, right at the start up here. Now if we'd hidden the sprite with a hide, that would prevent the enemies from touching it and they would then just walk straight through it. But using Ghost to fade them away to nothing actually keeps them fully touchable, which is very useful to know indeed. So test that again. And yeah, that looks good. We have our enemies moving just as we want it. So finally, before we finish, there's one more issue to address. Come with me to a scene with a moving door. I'm going to place a new enemy on the screen to the right of this door. Stop the project, make the enemy visible, position them, and then in the when I receive change scene script, we need a new check for scene four. I only want to spawn a single enemy, so remove all the rest of the spawns. Fill out the X and Y positions from the stage. Right, so what's going to be the problem with this? Any ideas? Are you watching? 
Ah, they can walk through doors. Or more specifically, they can walk through moving platforms. So we have another sprite we need to check for enemy collisions against. Yeah, back in the enemy sprite. Find the move left or right script and introduce a touching platform block. We need the OR operator again as the enemy is blocked if it is touching a safe zone or a platform. So pop that in and here we go. Yes, the enemy is now behaving less like a red ghoul and more like the nice chomping enemy that we wanted. That's great to see. I'll just go grab the key to this door. And now we can let ourselves in. If I wait for this guy, I can let them through the door too. Oh, whoops. Looks like they got caught. I guess at this point we could do some extra checks and set them to get squished. But I'm not overly bothered by this little quirk. Maybe we'll revisit this in a later episode too, because well, this is all we have time for today. I only covered one of so many possible enemy types and behaviours, but I hope you might try to add all sorts of enemies to your platformers now yourselves. When you do, Please submit them to the studio linked under this video. I'm really looking forward to seeing them. I'm dead keen to make a video showcasing them, but since there's so many, I'll be opening first dibs to my channel members. So watch out for a member-only post about it in the coming weeks, and keep up the great work. I hope if you enjoy this video, you'll smash the like button, and don't forget to subscribe so as not to miss my next exciting video. If you are an educator or a super loyal fan, then you might consider supporting me further by joining the channel membership. There's added perks like channel emoji, priority comments, early access to videos, and for those that want them, access to the Scratch projects themselves. But until next time, have a great week ahead and scratch on guys.